Hi! Welcome to this part of my review featuring Fading Suns The Universe book. If you haven't seen the other parts of my review featuring this space opera passion play, please check out the playlist in the description below. This time we are going to talk about the other estates. In this particular video we are going to talk about the Phoenix Throne. Views of the Phoenix Throne are as varied as the people who hold them. For some, the Emperor offered much more than just stability. There were nobles in all houses, even those that battled him, who hoped that the Pax Alexius would herald a new era of grace and glory. Many of these nobles flocked to his service as questing knights, and most of these still serve. Even those who have returned to their own houses invariably maintain close ties to the imperial court, praising its members and defending its reputation. Many throughout the known worlds see his court as the apex of culture and accumulation of beings unequaled since the time of Vladimir. However, even as legends have grown about Alexius and his cohorts, so too have darker stories and rumors, tales that cause even some of his most fervent followers to question their beliefs. Let's talk about Emperor Alexius and the Imperial family. Alexius's rise to power brought with it an amazing range of emotions in his new subjects, a spectrum of responses from the brightest hope for the future to the darkest fears of his real motivations. His ability as a military strategist was without question, proven in battle again and again. Also unquestioned was his ability to quickly make a conquered land prosperous. Even after the Emperor Wars ended, this prosperity continued. For centuries, regents have plundered Vladimir's old holdings. Imperial wealth funded their own ambitions or debaucheries. Alexius has invested this bounty back into the people and the land. This has led some to see him as a liberator while others see him as a dangerous radical for the same reason. After the passing of a generation, no dramatic changes have taken place and some of the Emperor's early supporters are growing disillusioned. Alexius's efforts face constant opposition. If Alexius is too careless in his implementation, his opponents will unite and the Phoenix Throne will be in danger. With the disappearance on stigmata of his paramour, Lady Theophana al-Malik, the opposition might have a chance. Many of the loyalists who had won the Emperor Wars with him had already left the court, either returning to their own lands, retiring or dying of old age. Some would say that Alexius has lost interest in ruling and he has become somewhat of a recluse. It was only when his foes began talking openly about reinstating the regency with voting scepters, following the ancient tradition, that Alexius's allies pushed him to again demonstrate his leadership. Instead, he disappeared from all court functions for several months. The leaders of the regency faction often point to the actions of the emperor's courtiers as proof of the emperor's extreme agenda. As one would expect, his reception of emissaries from the barbarian worlds created even more rage. Now let's talk about Freya Eldritch's daughter. And before I want to make a small note that she looks really ugly in the cover of the Game Master book, but here she looks kinda nice, kinda cute, as you would expect from a noble. Even though she is a barbarian, so she is quite muscular. She looks so ugly in the cover of that other book, so I would have preferred if they used this image right here as a better example of the sort of noble woman that she is. So about Freya Eldritch's daughter, shortly after Alexius returned and restructured his court, the shield maiden Freya Eldritch's daughter appeared before the Phoenix throne as part of a delegation from Hargard. In response to the Emperor's invitation, her people, the Baldrak, sought formal relations with the known worlds, including a permanent embassy. 
many known worlders, especially Hogwarts, were horrified that Alexius granted their request so quickly and so generously. It quickly became clear that the Baldrock sought allies for some future campaign. The opposition to the Empire getting involved in an intra Baldrock feud grew, but the barbarians made no formal request. Instead, the Emperor and his closest confidants spent hours with the visitors discussing a wide range of topics. Shortly after the Hargard Embassy opened, Freya and her own entourage made a tour of the known worlds, meeting with leaders from all the factions. The gossip networks quickly began spreading tales of the Ice Maiden. Her beauty was undeniable, but everything else was open to speculation. So you see, even here in the description, they tell you that she is really beautiful, but in wow, you really need to take a look at the cover of the Game Master book. She looks, she looks like a Karen, honestly. Legend had it, she had battled Kurgans, Symbiotes and other Baldrock. Oh, and also some Hawkwoods. These rumors popped up upon Freya's initial arrival in the known worlds, but they exploded when the Emperor announced their surprise engagement. In no time at all, competing rumors of her heroism and perfidy mushroomed. Those few people willing to ask the Empress to be about any of these rumors only received silence and slightly disdainful smiles. Still, shortly before the wedding, a number of Hogwood families that had lost members in Baldrock space received imperial visits and gifts of money, of course. Once Freya became Empress, the rumors continued to spread, but no one dared ask her about them. As Empress, she spends most of her time by her husband's side or with Aurora, their daughter. Freya regularly accompanies her husband as he tends to his own duties, though she rarely publicly comments on them. While the role of Empress is ill-defined, she has begun taking a leadership role in the Emperor's plans for Hargard. Of course, some critics contend that she has already discharged her only real duty with the birth of the Princess. Let's talk about Princess Aurora. The birth of Princess Aurora sparked unparalleled celebrations throughout the known worlds, far surpassing even those for Alexis's coronation or marriage. Empress Freya's popularity reached all new heights during her pregnancy. Still just an infant, Aurora has received more attention than any human child of the past thousand years. Around her at all times are her guards a mix of her father's most loyal phoenix guards and her mother's fellow shield maidens. So far, Princess Aurora has spent her short life on Byzantium Secundus, but it is no secret that her father wants to take her to Ravenna. Her mother wants to take her beyond the limits of the Empire's traditions, showing her Hargard. What Aurora wants, no one yet knows. Let's talk about questing knights and cohorts. Not all nobles have a respectable place in their family's fifths. Second or third sons and daughters don't have much to inherit and must thus seek out their own opportunities. Many of them look to Emperor Alexius, who 20 years ago chartered the company of the Phoenix. These questing knights swear a term of fealty to the Emperor and trouble the realm enacting his new vision. Whether it be upholding fealty rights for downtrodden peasants, putting down republican rebellions, traveling into barbarian space, or seeking evidence of the lost worlds. Some priests hear the call to more worldly duty, inflamed by the values and vision espoused by Emperor Alexius. To this view is open the role of Imperial Cohort to Alexius's Questing Knights. A priest accepted into this august company gives spiritual succor and advice to a knight, accompanying them on their travels into dire lands far from the bosom of the church. It is not only knights and priests to whom Emperor Alexius has extended his call for duty, he also summons guild members to become Imperial Cohorts. These worthies must offer aid and assistance to his questing knights. 
In return for offering their skills and fealty, they reap the rewards of first claim on the merchant routes into newly explored territories. Let's talk about the Imperial Eye. Before his assassination, Emperor Vladimir established a fact-finding and intelligence-gathering organization called the Imperial Eye. Yes, obviously nothing related to real-world Illuminati and Freemasons. He brought in nobles from a number of royal and minor houses, gave them extensive budgets to establish the agency, and then died. The Eye lived on, however, serving the stewards and regents who took over after Vladimir's death and before Alexius's rise. Officially, this organization serves Alexius by gathering and analyzing information. Accusations of activities like spying, smuggling and even assassination rarely came to anything. When an agent was tried, the agency always managed to show that he was acting outside the boundaries of the eye's mandate, conveniently. The eye is constantly under suspicion of shady activities. However, no evidence ever appeared that the eye had actually tried to make one of its own into a new patriarch. The leaders of the eye hold themselves up as selfless servers of humanity. Its detractors denounce them as self-serving manipulators who plot and scheme against everybody. Whatever the case, the eye has a reputation among the common folk as an organization to avoid, second only to the Inquisition. When Alexius became regent, charges that the eye acted beyond its official scope multiplied. Right after Alexius took the throne, the eye expanded once again, ostensibly growing to deal with barbarians and other distant threats, the eye in fact worked both at home and abroad, helping to ensure that the new emperor could keep his throne. As Alexius consolidated power, however, the immediacy of these threats waned. It's important to note, however, that after Alexius's return to vibrancy, he replaced almost all the leaders of the eye. In doing so, he rarely promoted from within, which had been the past tradition. Trusted questing knights and cohorts found themselves in positions of authority, much to the consternation of agency traditionalists. The new leaders still sit in command, but whispers abound that their eyes do not see what is happening in all corners of the agency. Concerning both scepters, the question of both scepters became an important one again during Alexius's reclusion, following Theophana's death. Vladimir created the powerful symbols on his own authority, referencing a tradition from diasporan times. Alexius's advisors had long asserted his ability to do the same, either creating new ones or reassigning those that existed. Each royal house claims five scepters, while each of the official church sects and major guilds each has one. Any attempt to reassign the existing scepters would likely spark a new war. And this concludes this part of the review. In the next part, we are going to talk about peasants, the Baldrock Star Nation, and the Kurga Caliphate. As you can see, things are very fragile, almost teetering on the brink of conflict. There are many enemies opposed to Alexis's reign. There are still others that support Alexis's empire. But with major events such as Alexis's marriage to Freya, the birth of their daughter, the things discovered about the eye, the opportunities for advancement for guild members, for nobles, for members of the church, if they become questing knights or if they support questing knights. It's all a fountain of infinite ideas for adventures and campaigns. Will the player characters oppose Alexius? Will they support him? Or will they try to thrive no matter who sits at the imperial throne? Thank you for watching this part of the review. If you have any comments or questions, please let me know. And thank you so much to those of you that have been supporting the channel by sending drive-through RPG gift certificates. 
If anyone else wants to further support the channel, the information on how to do that will be in the description below. Once again, thank you and see you later.